Hi, and welcome to Green Planet, Blue Planet podcast, highlighting artists, teachers, authors, and philanthropeneurs of the regenerative movement. People who are committed to and showcase qualities of planetary leadership. My name is Julian Guderlei. I am committed to a world that allows people from all walks of life to thrive. I'm your host and creator of Green Planet, Blue Planet podcast. And in today's episode, my guest is John Liu. Welcome, John. Thank you. Good to be here. John is a filmmaker and ecologist. He is also a researcher at several institutions. In January 2015, John was named a visiting fellow at Netherlands Institute of Ecology and of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences, as well as an ecosystem ambassador for the Commonland Foundations based in Amsterdam. In 2017, John founded Ecosystem Restoration Camps, a worldwide movement that aims to restore damaged ecosystems on a large scale. And I'm looking forward to talk about that quite a bit. He's also recently been featured in Kiss the Ground, streaming on Netflix, and The Age of Nature, streaming on PBS, educating millions about regenerative action and the state of the world. So with these words, welcome, John. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about this idea of ecosystem restoration camps. And, you know, the, the literal act of kissing the ground, taking, taking land or soil that has been depleted, that has been, you know, abused in a certain way, um, and, and bringing it back to life and nurturing it back to life. Do you mind sharing how, how that idea started for you that you realized, um, I want to set up a, a, a planetary grid of restoration camps? Well, um, I think it's probably best to go back a little bit further to consider what happened. So I, I, I was um, documenting the restoration of the cradle of Chinese civilization in the upper and middle reaches of the Yellow River. It's called the Lus Plateau. You can see numerous films, the ones that you mentioned, but the other ones like Lessons of the Lus Plateau or Hope in a Changing Climate or uh, Green Gold all, all have uh, descriptions of this work. And what happened was that this led to many different kinds of restoration projects in different parts of the world, Africa and other, other parts of the world. But I thought that the speed that this was going, because we made some rather significant understandings in the restoration, I thought, well, we have to do this quickly and now, and why does it take so long for the institutions to, to get going, to set up a project and finance a project? And then when these projects, they're, they're usually finite, so three or five years or something like that. And then it's very expensive and very kind of top heavy with managers and, and the, the amounts of money that actually go to restoring the earth is much less than the, than the whole infrastructure of maintaining that, those hierarchies. And it's also, it, the main thing though, is it's not fast enough. So I started having these dreams and these dreams were that people would wake up in the morning in camps in different parts of the world and they would go off and have some coffee and, and have a little breakfast and then go do a few hours of work and then come back and rest in the middle of the day. And then when it's cooler, kind of go out and do a little bit more. And then they'd have dinner and play guitar around the campfire. And, and I thought, well, that's a beautiful fantasy but nobody's gonna do that. I mean, I've made all these films already about um, restoration and people say nice things about it, but that doesn't, they don't run out and start doing restoration. So I thought, oh, no one will do that. So I kind of rejected the dream. And then I kept having the dream. So that was a kind of, to me, that meant I was, I was processing this kind of information um, subconsciously or while I was asleep. I don't know exactly how that works, dream states or something. But, um, but then I thought, well, I'm processing this and it's recurrent, so I should write about it. So I started writing about it in essays I wrote in Permaculture Magazine and in Cosmos uh, Journal. And then I, 
I wrote on about uh, wrote about it in um, social media, and it turned out that then first a few, and then hundreds, and then thousands, and then tens of thousands of people started to respond to this dream, and they were kind of saying, "Well, we're having the same dream." And I thought that's really interesting. That's different. So the question for me then was, how do you move it from this theoretical state of talking about restoration to practical physical work on restoration? And that seems to be, you know, making these camps. So we started, as you said, 2017, we had, we started the first camp in Spain. And then we started the second camp the next year in Mexico. And as we kept going, then there were the third year, there were 21 camps and now there are 37 camps in different parts of the world. So they're sort of popping up. They're self-organizing, self-governing and autonomous. And it allows people who are not normally, like it's not, they're not in this necessarily in this expert class, but I think that they're more effective at composting, more effective at revegetation, more effective at protecting and, and encouraging and increasing biodiversity than people who sit in ivory towers somewhere and talk about it. So this, this is a kind of practical and physical activity so you need to do it you can't you can't understand this and then not realize that well it's not a theoretical question it's a physical solution to major problems and you know potentially existential problems that we face mm -hmm. so that that was my my original thing and then it, it just started taking off and i think when when you see exponential growth in camps like this, one, two, 21, 37, that's like, that's a trend line. You can start to map what, what this means. And this is in six continents. This is not in one country. This is worldwide. And it's, um, it's not culturally specific. So, it works for indigenous people in Guatemala or in Kenya or in India or in the United States and it works in Germany and it works in, you know, all over the world. So um, I think this is, this is something that we haven't had before. <laughs> something that is led by the people is physical and does what needs to be done. It's not a theoretical discussion of like, we're having climate change. So let's have another meeting in an exotic place. And lots of experts will go there and they're all being paid huge amounts of money. If that money just went directly to the people to, to do restoration, you'd solve the problem. You wouldn't be talking about the problem anymore. You'd be solving the problem. So that's kind of what, what happened to me. Yeah, that's really powerful. I love both the idea that it, you know, that the idea came through in the dream state. And then as you were writing about it, you realize that there's thousands of people who are actually having the same dream. Um, the restoration camps, I think, you know, you're aiming to, to get 1 million people to actually have their hands in the soil, right? To literally be, be engaged. I think that's too small of a, of a, of a goal. So that's not my goal, but that's what that, you know, it, it's basically what people can imagine. And so you have some people and they, they see, oh, well, it's really hard <laughs> to organize these things. How do you get money? How do you get the infrastructure there? How do you have the knowledge flows going? You know, and how do people find their way there and get there? So that's all they can imagine because they can, but, but as, as the, as the thing turns over, I think they'll they'll get there in two years instead of 10 years or, you know, like that. And then they'll go, oh, well, that goal wasn't enough. And then it'll be 10 million or 50 million or 100 million or a billion. And that's probably what's going to happen. Yeah, and beautiful. If, if it doesn't happen that way, then I think we're in trouble for, for the restoration movement because 
the crisis is upon us. It's not like coming in the future. It's here now. So you have to understand this, that, that that's also changed my um, rhetorical think, thinking because I used to think, well, you, you better prepare because the crisis, you know, this is gonna lead to a crisis, you know, and when you hit this particular point, it's gonna, things are gonna start breaking. And that's where we're, we are, you know, the, the increase in frequency and, and amplitude of hurricanes or extreme weather events, flooding, mudslides, drought, wildfires. I mean, what more do you need? <laughs> you know, I mean, if you, when, when, when do you understand, uh, you know, if you say, show me a sign and a city is wiped out by a hurricane and a and a island is wiped out by a hurricane and there's a undersea earthquake which causes a tsunami that takes out multiple nuclear power plants or there's multi-year drought followed by wildfires on different you know in south africa in brazil in california in australia in the arctic it's a hundred degrees in the arctic in the summer, you know, when do you say, well, okay, thank you for the sign. I, We've understood I, the I, sign. I yeah. You know, we, we're forced to realize that it's not how much is the, is the profit from a box store or, or the stock market that is giving us life. It's air, water, for soil fertility, biodiversity. It's these things. And that we've gone so far away that now we don't actually know nature in many cases. We're living in abiotic systems. We're living in virtual reality talking. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a wonderful tool that we can talk over long distances using this thing, but it's not the same as physical changes to earth systems, which alter the life support systems for not only hum humanity, but all life. So we're, we're, we're just in another order of magnitude when we consider what is actually happening in earth systems and the value of earth systems. And now we have this economy, which is fundamentally false because it values things. Well, those things just end up in the junk pile they're not really at all in the same league with the value of the oxygenated atmosphere or the naturally regulated hydrological cycle weather and climate. So now we don't know how we, 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 we've gone so far down this path that we don't know how to get back to this other path. And so the other part of ecosystem restoration camps is we need to practice. We need to live in a way that is not over consumption, uh, you know, over consumpting, over consuming, and that doesn't have toxic pollution and that fulfills our psychological and social psychological needs as well as our physical needs. And now we've created a, a, a situation which is mass stratification. We have more billionaires during a global health crisis. And we, at the same time, we have billions of poor people at the edges of large degraded ecosystems. Well, we're, we're not really processing what that data means. If we say, well, the economy's okay. We, we have to go this way. It'll, it'll all rebound. We'll just, if, we're, if we have growth in the stock market, all is well, you know. That's ridiculous. If we have growth in the stock market, it means more billionaires. And at the same time, it means more billions of people in hunger and, and misery. So if that's the best we can do as human beings, I think we're you know, a miserable excuse for a species. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love your passion and, and the clarity with which you're delivering that. I, I'm, I'm so with you, you know, it's, I think it's the narratives on how to be in this transition are very, very important because for these billions of people who live in poverty, of course, 
there there is there is a, a difficult kind of playing field because there is this illusion of keeping up the game the the rent game the the income game the etc so what i'm really most curious about in the, in regards to the restoration camps that you have kicked off and started just for a few years now is those thousands of people that already live and engage in in this kind of a way of living and being what's the the social uh, fabric the community fabric that you can that you can share from well <clears throat> I think there are several aspects of this. So from a like climate mitigation and adaptation perspective, you can say, well, those people are now disconnected from the solution. So they're like wandering around trying to make a living or maybe farming on the side of a hillside or begging or, you know, whatever. And, um, or trying to exist in, you know, having a poor job, low paying, and they can't even pay their rent or, and their food. So they're kind of, or their child, you know, they're, they're like, shall we eat this week or will I pay the school fees or, you know, shall we have pay the rent? You know, so that, that's all very fragile in that particular point of view. And uh, <clears throat> so the first thing is these people who are disconnected can be connected to the solution. They have, they have the ability to act, they have agency. And by, by taking this opportunity to act, that's the way to make their own lands, their own communities, their own families as resilient as possible to the negative impacts that are almost, in, well, they're inevitable impacts now from climate changes. So if we want to protect these people, then they need to protect themselves and, and mitigate against the worst possible outcomes so that they don't happen and adapt to the inevitable outcomes. So that's first. That's like survival level thinking. The next aspect of this is that now they're miserable and they're unable to keep up and they don't even understand the other system, the system that they're forced to work in under. They're basically indentured servitude. So it's a type of slavery. And when you, when you understand this and you think, okay, if they were doing something else, which had meaning. So now they know that if I do this work, the soil is fertile the biodiversity returns, the birds and the beauty and the, and the food that this brings and the hydrological regulation. Okay, so suddenly they're doing something which they can understand instead of something that they can't understand and actually can never really succeed in because even if they were to get the best degree, go to school, get the best degree and then get a job, they would join the oppressor class. So then they're, you know, so they would leave the oppression to become oppressors. Well, that's not really a choice. You know, that's not like, okay, here's your choice. Be oppressed or oppress others. You know, it's like, what a stupid, you know, ridiculous kind of thing. And that's where we are. So in this, in this scenario, at going to ecosystem restoration camps, learning to restore soil fertility and infiltration and retention of moisture and vegetation and biodiversity is something that you can do wholeheartedly because you know that's, that, that, that's benefiting yourself, but not just benefiting yourself and your family, it's benefiting all life and future generations and the earth. So it's a completely different way to feel. And then when you're doing this, you're, you're not like running around trying like, how can I do this and that? You're like, okay, here we are. And, and I would also recommend don't work too hard. I don't think the purpose of life is to be slaves and drudge around, you know, it's like, let's have a good time and do this. And so in, in their organization, then they can say, well, you know, if we all have a kitchen, then we all have a huge amount of infrastructure in kitchen equipment and in the economic thinking well we that's good we have a lot of of uh 
appliance sales. <laughs> so appliance sales go up and the GDP goes up. So isn't that good? No, <laughs> because all of that all of that embedded energy in those machines means that you have to dig up huge parts of the earth, which are then massively degraded scars on the earth. And you've got all this stuff and it lasts for maybe 10 years, 20 years, if you're really robust with it. And then it turns into rusting junk and might have even toxic substances leaking into the water. So no, this is not a rational way for civilization to act. So if we have central kitchens and we teach people how to use central kitchens in ecosystem restoration camps, and we say in this community, everybody is fed, there is no hunger. Like if we just have a little bit, we all share it and then, and then that's all we have. But if we have a lot, if we have abundance, well, everybody eats great, it's a banquet every night. And, and everybody eats and everybody is, is, has full nutrition. And okay, let's also say that if we choose, we can eliminate all poisonous foods. <laughs> we can only have organic and biodynamic and local and fair trade. And you know, suddenly we're influencing at a higher level. And so that, that means everybody's eating together. And eating together means you're having a great conversation together. And if you get this organized, it's really easy. The food is easy. The, the washing up is easy. And everything becomes really joyous as a community comes together and cares for one another. And that says, oh, have you eaten? Ha you know, come, are you hungry? Come and eat dinner. We have food. It's not a transactional thing. It's not theater. It's, 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 it's real. So can you have a joyous meal with your friends and family and community? Yes. Then you're, then you're healthy. Then if the kids are eating well, their education is better. Their brain development, their whole development of their bodies as they grow up is, is equal. Instead of having some people who have nutrient deficiencies and developmental problems. So yeah, I mean, it, it, it starts to affect all aspects of life if you do this. And I also don't really think that ecosystem restoration camps are the, you know, the, they're not the destination, they're a waypoint. Yeah, yeah. That's where we need to go now to learn how to restore the earth. And everybody should go to camp, learn how to live in a community, share, no one falls through the cracks and that all can contribute because that's the way we can really restore the earth the way we've created now with these hierarchies with vertical hierarchies most of the people don't know what they're doing and they're being told you have to do this by somebody who wants to have control over others but if they, are, if they know what they're doing and they get up in the morning happily saying, well, I'm going off to restore soil fertility and grow food and make sure that my children and future generations of life have a functional earth, that's different. They don't need anybody to tell them what to do. They know what they're doing. So they learn these basic skills. And as they go higher and higher in that, the communities get better and better. And at that point, when they've had this experience, they can go and create a eco villages. And these eco villages, they're they're the more of a destination. But if you if you go right to the eco villages and you don't have the skills of how, how to live together in harmony and how to work eff effectively and efficiently, then th there's a high probability that the eco villages will fail. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about that for a second here. The you know, the, the skills of leadership or self-leadership that are required, the resilience, being able to face uncomfortable situations, because as you said it, like on a global scale right now, on a planetary scale, we're facing a very uncomfortable situation with, you know, global pollution, with a, um, you know, dying soil. So, so what are some of the skills on a social level that can help us embrace the uncomfortable and and say yes to to life say yes to living with life well 
I think that the the thing that you have to realize is that an, the the sort of anxiousness or fear comes from ignorance. So if you if you look at these like the toxic pollution is really scary or climate change or drought wildfires they're really scary if you don't know the solution but if you know the solution they're like less scary because while they're very bad we can tough it out we're hu we're human beings we're a social species that has sent people to the moon that can make satellites and we're talking over this thing you know so we have the ability to to do quite a bit so the problem is that we sort of have created this hierarchy that says some people have a different social status or a different power and a different uh, access to wealth and abundance and others well no they're not good <laughs> they're not equal you know and that's just fundamentally untrue because if you're alive today all all of our ancestors were hunter gatherers all of our ancestors were semi nomadic herders all of our ancestors were subsistence agriculturalists and then there's this bifurcation and and social developments over historical time but if we look at those, those are based on murder and genocide and slavery and, you know, what? Why do we want to hold on to that? Why don't we have truth and reconciliation? Why don't we say, hey, that was then, this is now. And we, we see these things and we don't like them and we don't have to accept them. Yeah, they happened and we have to see that that's unacceptable. You can't kill people. You can't go into their land and say, well, I have a bigger gun. So now your, your land is my land. What are you talking about? You know, this is gross, immoral behavior. So it's not actually human, it's pre-human behavior. So here we are now, it's the 21st century. It's our time, we're alive now for a few years or a few decades more. I'm 67, I'm not gonna be around. It's not about me. It's about future generations. So what can I do to contribute to their well-being? They won't necessarily know who I am, but if I make certain decisions and I they have fertile soils, they'll have clean water you can drink out of the streams. They'll have food everywhere around them because that's the that's the the representation of ecological succession and evolution. All right, so let's let's encourage the highest expression of evolution rather than oh let's cut it all down and cover it with with impermeable surfaces which raise the surface temperatures and alter the climate and change the hydrology and the weather. So if we understand these things, um, and we all have to understand these things. Yeah, you know? let me ask a question right there because I, I like where you're going with it. I think I agree to a, to a certain point, we all have to learn and understand these things. My question is like, what do you think is specifically required for humanity to learn from its past mistakes the way you just kind of led us there because you know growing up in in germany where i grew up for me I, I thought that the lessons of the genocides and the holocaust and and that not just across europe but across us as a species i thought these are lessons we've learned from history and then i had to realize over the last 30 years that that's not necessarily so and so what's what's your take on that what what does it actually take for humanity to to truly learn from its past mistakes? Well, there has been progress. So, I mean, we have many, many uh, sort of teachers or, or people who have transcended the, the normal reality. So you can, you know, Jesus or Buddha or 
Gandhi or Martin Luther King or Nelson Mandela. You have all these people who have told us what, but we haven't processed it because the, yeah, you know, I, I would say based on what I see, so there's a huge difference between say the Judeo-Christian Islamic and then the European uh, colonial expansion. So if you, if you follow that trajectory from Judeo-Christian Islamic um, cosmology through European acceptance of Christianity and then, then you know, crusades and Renaissance and I mean, all, the, all these things that happened and then, in, and then the industrial revolution and the, the colonization and spreading of the dominant current economic paradigm. And then you compare that with say indigenous cosmologies in South America or Africa or North America or anywhere in the world, you find that the difference is that the indigenous people had this sort of animistic belief system, which said all life is sacred. So they would look at a rock and that they would say, well, that rock is sacred. And actually that rock is living because it's covered with lichens. And the lichens are actually releasing minerals from the rock and the, the weather and everything. So their understanding was at a higher level than, oh, we can make a thing. And that thing is, 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 is what's valuable. No, this thing is a piece of junk that will end up in the trash heap leaking, you know, pollution into the water and into the air. So, so the, the understanding of the indigenous people was at a higher level, but it was simplistic, you know, metaphoric and mm -hmm. poetically, met, you know, poetic metaphor and oral history, but a deep, profound understanding. And then you have this sort of gross, brutalistic, you know, like we're going to kill you, we're smite you, you know, and now your land is our land. We're going to steal everything that you, all your beautiful artifacts or all your, you know, whatever, we're going to take it away. What are you talking about? You know, this is gross. And so that has to be dealt with. You can't like say, well, that was okay. You know, now everything, you know, everything that's come from that, what could go wrong? You know, everything can go wrong from that perspective. And it has. And it has, yeah, yeah. And so, it continues to do so unless yeah, we So now you have all these people who. No, go ahead, please. I, I was saying and it has and it, and it continues to do so, right? Unless we actually dare to change it because. Um, I'm in Canada as we're having this this conversation, and I think about this often. Like, how does this country even? How did this country come to exist? How how does how 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 are we per continuing on this? You know, in this reality where we have dollar bills with the face of the queen on it, <laughs> while we're while we're on on borrowed land. Of She's a very nice girl, but she <laughs> hasn't got a lot to say. Yeah, <laughs> listen. Yeah, I, no, I, come. I think it's important not to rant, so I'll try to d dial it a little bit. <laughs> a little bit of ranting is welcome. I think it's important to dial it back into solutions, and it's important to dial it back into pragmatic steps. Um, but we started out there, right? And I think your passion is very much um, welcome. The the you know the climate conversation at large is is often very frustrating to people and i think that's why many many people around the world kind of just like continue the ignorance the ignoring the deflecting the looking away because it is a very difficult conversation but at the same time um we got to have the difficult conversation to reunite with what you just shared like the you know maybe metaphoric poetic simplistic ways of indigenous cultures they have a lot to offer to us to how to bring this kind of harmony into our modern context. Well, I think you also have to have a holistic view of not only this, but everything. So when we realize that climate change is just one aspect of, of, of a 
host of like a perfect storm of crises. So maybe climate change is really a symptom of this larger disease. So you, you have human beings. Now, some human beings think that it's okay to have massive disparity. It's my right to gather to myself billions. Maybe we're gonna have trillionaires soon. Well, um, what? You know, how, how, can, how can that be okay? At the same time that you have all these other people who have nothing. So we need to somehow begin to realize, and, and, and it's not even true because those, the, the billions and trillions, they're just numbers. The reality is these people live a few decades and then they die. And, and I don't think if they die clutching their possessions, it's going to be any different for them, and, except that it's more, gro it's more grotesque. It's, it's more awful. So the, the people who live in simplicity and, and you know, I, I go all over the world and, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a little bit overweight and, you know, I'm like, you know, and I go into these places and they go, can we feed you? And I'm like, what, you know, why, you know, I mean, you know, no, you know, I don't need to take your food. You know, I, I have so much. And so what we, what I think is the real solution is to, connect all of these things together. So we need to feed everybody. So let's just do that. Let's just make central kitchens and feed everybody. And if we feed everybody, then we we're, we're, we're kind of notice that like, well, half of the food in the industrial food systems is wasted. That's kind of horrible. And anyway, who wants those industrial foods? Let's have real food. Let's have nutrient rich organic food you know, it's picked and eaten immediately and the flavors burst out and all of the, all of the nutrition is there. That's what we need. So can we do that? Yes. Is that possible? Yes. Is there tremendous amounts of degraded land? Yes. Do we need lots of people to restore those degraded lands? Yes. You know, are there lots of people who have nothing? and could do that? Yes. <laughs> you know, so I mean, if you kind of go down the checklist, you go like, okay, everything is there to make this happen. We just have to decide that we're going to do it. And when we when we start to understand what this means, we, we say, well, okay, we have a corrupt system, which comes to us from genocide and slavery, and inequality and murder. And, you know, it's like, oh, God, you know, Indiana, and I think I must have been ten years old when I realized there are no Indians in Indiana. How how is that? You know, so as a sensitive young person, this did not make me feel comfortable. This made me feel very bad. And then to to understand that, well, in reality, the organic layer of the earth is the decaying remains of all life since the beginning of time. Yeah. That's the difference between geologic materials and organic materials. So it's, you know, this is our time, we're alive now, but very soon we won't be alive and we'll be part of, uh, people will be walking on our, our bodies and our, our, all the material, and, and the, the materials in our bodies they're the same materials that were in other living things. Mm -hmm. So even, even the concept of reincarnation is not a theory. It's like, it's maybe not the transmission of personalities across. A, it's the physical materials in, in life. So when we understand this and when we, when we share this with, with each other in you know, and that, that becomes normal, then we're not confused anymore. We're feeding the hungry. We're housing the homeless. We're giving everybody there. How can there be unemployment at a time when we're facing existential threats 
from the collapse of natural ecosystems. So there's work for everybody. There's work for everybody, yeah, right? How can there be a concept as homelessness when there is empty homes standing yeah. around everywhere? It, there, there are a lot of these paradoxes that when we look deep enough with an understanding that you just outlined really eloquently, they, they just simply don't make sense. And because they still are so, it is our duty, our privilege and our mission to change them. And as you said earlier, like what it takes is making the choice and committing the lifetime that we have to that because we know it's, it's right now. But you said a few times that we only have a few decades in those bodies. And so I want to I wanna zoom out with you in, on the time stream here a bit, because this really, John, this is what made me go on this quest of starting this podcast. And I might have told you this before, and I know my, my listeners know this at, at this point. It's, it's the seven generational pursuit of, well, you know, thinking planning but especially being and then from that being the doing so so when we zoom out to seven generations how does this affect our way of showing up for the world and how does this you know give us optimism for this really huge challenge we're facing well i can only speak from my own um my own perspective and i think my perspective is sort of different because I've gone to over 90 countries around the world first as a journalist for a long time and then as a as an ecological researcher so my my perception about this is that um, large numbers of people are are kind of in a situation where they're victims and they they don't they've lost their basic human rights and we can, you know, like if we ask the question, like, how did they lose their basic human rights? Well, we are also know the answer. <laughs> we know how this happened. And so it's, it's connected to this Judeo-Christian Islamic worldview leading to European expansionism and colonization and then, the, and then mercantilism. So sort of mercantilism after the industrial revolution, this became the mechanism to, to promote this. So the lifestyles that people lived in nature were deemed to be unimportant and that somehow just like burning everything down and mining everything and manufacturing things could somehow, it was somehow the basis of life. So this, this mistaken understanding was spread all over the world and it doesn't bring any happiness. So the people who are slave trading or who are <laughs> committing genocide, they're not in better shape because they did these things. They're actually and live soulless lives and then you know, are surrounded by stuff while others suffer massively but how do you get out of it? And, and, and so for myself, it was, as a journalist, I, I didn't understand most of these things. I was running about trying to report on the, it's like being a, a, a like a f reporting on fires. So there's a, there's a, a crisis here. Okay, you know, the, the firefighters are now trying to put out the fire. Oh, somebody died over here. Oh my God, it's terrible. Look at the human tragedy. And, you know, but, but that's not like, why is there a fire? <laughs> There's only like, it's, it, it, it's the drama of this crisis. So that wasn't very satisfying for me. But now I've done 30 years almost of, of, ecosystem research into ecosystem function and i see well oh we didn't understand so the ignorance you have two aspects to this one is ignorance and the other is greed you know so ignorance and greed are not the highest expression of human consciousness they're low level types of of expression and they are the leading force in creating a military industrial complex and let's take over the world kind of idea. Um, 
but the majority of people don't have those feelings because education and and thought you know if if you if you want to maintain that kind of society you can't educate people <laughs> to plot trends look at physics and the understandings of of what's happening because we can understand if the surface temperatures increase in in one spot and then they 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 increase in all spots then the global average is going to be increased you know that's just the way it is so once you understand these things you realize well actually there are things that we can do about that but we're not doing them because our socialization is well that's not your place you're not allowed to do that you're you're not a thinker you're you're a worker bee you know you're supposed to shut up and do what you're told well you know eventually that doesn't work because people say well no i i refuse to do that and now you have 7.8 billion people and you have this corrupt infrastructure that's been built up over centuries and maybe millennia really if you think about it so it goes back a long way and so hundreds of generations have endured this kind of thing but now there's no benefit for the oppressors <laughs> the, the children of the oppressors face the same fate as the children of the oppressed because so there's and and, and even the children of the oppressors they don't want it. They're done with it. You know, they, they don't want to be remembered forever as, as cre causing genocide and slavery. And, you know, they want to be the solution. So how do you be the solution? You have to restore all the earth. You have to treat everybody fairly. You have to make, make the people who have lost their human rights regain their human rights. So this is completely possible at this point, but we have to stop with the stratification of the society and realize that all, all life is a representation of all life since the beginning of time. That's not just all people, that's all life. All life, yeah. And so if we, if we understand this, then we can't treat some people as, as less important we have to realize that they're just as important. They have agency. When they have agency and they do what they need to make their landscapes and their com families and communities as resilient as possible, then they need to get their human rights back. All right, so that's, that's, a, that's a pathway to sustainability. That's a pathway to survival for humanity. And that's also a, a way to uh, these inequities that have been built up over huge amounts of time to say, well, okay, we understand those inequities, but we're not gonna continue them. We're, we're, gonna, we're going to do something completely different because th that was wrong. And we, we acknowledge that, we recognize that, and we wanna do what's right. So, can we do that? Can we sit and talk about these things? Yes, we're a lot, there's a lot of talk. Can we go beyond talk and doing things? Well, it seems so. So the camps movement increases. More camps are coming, more camps. And you know we have to stop thinking that it's okay to do everything in virtual reality. We're not gonna solve climate change online. We're going to have to restore the ecological function. We're going to have to restore the hydrological cycle. We're going to have to moderate the extreme weather and climate impacts. And this is completely possible, especially if we engage the whole population. So if the whole population stops thinking that work means going to a cubicle to buy and sell plastic junk, but work means doing what's physically necessary to bring back functional earth systems and that that's extremely valuable. And so anybody who does that is doing the most valuable work on the planet and 
anybody who's going to a cubicle to buy and sell plastic junk is not doing something which is absolutely necessary. So suddenly we're getting into the place where, okay, well, let's just engage everybody. Let's give everybody basic incomes to do what needs to be done so that, and, and then everybody can eat, nobody will be hungry. We won't have this massive disparity where somebody can say, well, I have giant yachts and five jet planes and a warehouse filled with sports cars, while billions of people are starving at the edges of deserts and the, the climate's changing. And, we're, you know, so, you know, that's where we are at this moment. And who can, who can see this? Who can explain this? Who can understand this? We all can, if we consider it. And so we have to then work together with everybody who understands, and it's probably not everybody, it's probably a critical mass. So if we have 21% of the population who says, well, I, I think everybody's lives matter. I think you know, black lives matter. I think brown lives matter. I think you know, red lives matter, white lives matter. Everybody matters. Humanity matters. We're all related to each other. And not only that, we're related to all other life. And we're living in symbiosis with all other life. So from that perspective, living in symbiosis with all life, what can we do? We can restore all degraded lands. We can all have abundance. So it's a choice. We have this choice. Shall we maintain a corrupt system and continue to abuse billions of people while a small minority of people are elevated to uh, unbelievable privilege? Or shall we distribute the, the abundance to everybody so everyone can live fairly and, and with dignity? That seems like a very plausible uh, kind of steps of action, right? One is access to the abundance that's there right now. If that's basic incomes, if that is new ways of relating time exchange or cryptocurrencies. And then step two is activating all these people to actually restoring the earth. If this is, you know, in my, with my local community on a local farm, or if this is in a, a restoration camp, but as long as we're actually having our own hands in the, in the soil, like my experience with that is, um, you know, having gone to many different permaculture villages and eco villages around the world also and, and learning and, and, and maybe, you know, consistently being challenged with this, can I do more question? Cause it is, it is very deeply in there. Like, can I do more and how do I do more? But the moment hand and feet are in the soil, there's also like a different flow of information. You said it earlier, like we're connected to all of life, not just in theory of uh, reincarnation, but in reality of how these molecules rearrange. Right. And so, once we have our hand and feet on the soil, there is something magical, not so magical that happens. And that's communication with earth and the intelligence of earth. So I think I have, um, I have two more questions for you, John. This is exciting. And I, I'm so glad you had, you have so much to share. And, and that's why I just, I just let you, you know, just um, unfold because I think it's so important to learn from the path that you've chosen, maybe that, that life has chosen for you, you know? And so the two questions I have, number one is about trust, because I believe that a lot of people feel ready, but then somewhat disempowered and are afraid and there's no trust and the systems and the people at the top, et cetera. And we, we already talked about how hierarchy in itself is one of the killers of equality and, and true wealth and, and restored earth. But how do you personally, John, how do you, how do you experience trust? What is required for you to experience trust? That's a that's an interesting question. Um, so there is so much negative um, data around that it can be slightly overwhelming. But as a journalist and as an ecological researcher going around the world, I just found that the majority of people are wonderful. So it doesn't really matter what class or anything, people are generous and empathetic and 
and caring. So essentially we need to encourage those traits. We need to, to celebrate those traits. And I also noticed that like, we need to kind of get into smaller groups. So something like 30 to 50 people is kind of manageable. <laughs> you know, you can, it's, it's, it's powerful because you have 30 to 50 people. And if they, if, they, if they all have the same intention and they work together to make that intention uh, appear, that's, a, that's almost unstoppable. But if you have like thousands and thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people and they're all standing there and like, what, what do we do? Well, that doesn't necessarily increase the collective IQ <laughs> to have more people there wondering what to do. So if we create, so ecosystem restoration camps is a way to sort of get a manageable size that can do something and train and lots of people can learn how to do things, but it's also very effective because that size of group can do something <laughs> that's, that, that is serious and it can expand. So if we can use these camps to sort of self <laughs> duplicate themselves. So people go to camps and they learn how to, how to do these things and they find out, well, here I have a safe place to live. I have food and I have meaningful work. And if we can add the basic income concept to that and we can add nutrition and childcare and education and all of these things, then you're starting to move away from, from the camps concept to the next step of eco villages. But you're going to eco villages now with the skill set necessary to control the water, the soil, the vegetation, and and social psychological skills to live in harmony with others. Well, that's good, you know. So, so suddenly you you see. Well, this is a holistic way of leading us to where we need to be, and we don't have to like say, well, that's somewhere deep in the future. You can go now today. <laughs> to 37 different camps around the world and there are many more forming. So you can go now and start today. So you don't have to wait. But as you, as you do work and these, the, the effectiveness of those efforts happen, then there's suddenly more carefully defined natural infrastructure. So once we understand that through earth architecture, we can infiltrate all the water that comes down on any structure that we make. And so our structures, instead of being toxic things that end up as junk, become natural materials and they absorb and recycle and filter the water system. And they're filled with vegetation. And they're, they're distributed nursery systems where you can have indigenous plants growing surrounding you. So then everybody is learning about everything <laughs> at the same time. And we're all going down to the central kitchen for breakfast, lunch, and dinner and snacks. So everybody's fed. And this is the most valuable thing that you can do at a time when human civilization is threatened by climate change. So engaging the largest number of people with the lowest cost but the highest outcome is critical now and that's what i saw in that earlier stages with the sort of institutional expert led restoration activities that can never do what the people can do because it means that the knowledge is stratified with a few people who walk around like they're special and everybody else is asking well what do we do but in this, this model, everybody knows what to do and they all study what to do. And as soon as they know what to do, they can make another camp. And when, those, when that happens, then they can make another camp and more camps. And then the whole place is 
flooded and the entire population of the earth is engaged in ecosystem restoration. Yeah, empowering and encouraging all individuals to so I think that's where trust, trust comes from experience. Unique. Say that again, trust comes from experience. experience. Yeah, so if you mm -hmm. experience living in a community where everyone cares for each other and no one falls through the track cracks, you know, like if you, if you live in a society where you have to step over people who are lying yeah. on the sidewalk, that's not the same as saying, are you okay? Do you need some food? Do you need some, do you, what, what, why are you lying in the street? You know, so we need to get in this place where we can't walk past people who are, who are dying on the side of the road. Yeah, very well put. Very well put. John, I have one last question. Thank you so much for, you know, your time here and, and this, this deep dive into what you're seeing. And so the last question goes back to what you said at the very beginning about uh, how this vision for eco restoration camps really came to you in, in, in dream state, right? So thinking and feeling seven generational here with me for, for this last question. What are other dreams that you have, your, your dreams, your vision for the planet, for our species, um, beyond what you've shared so far? Well, I'm not sure that that's sort of up to individuals exactly to, to spin a dream for all everyone and everything. I think I, think I feel more like when you have a certain level of consciousness and you're acting, you're present for what's happening. You're like, okay, there are wildfires here. Well, we've got to do, we got to deal with the wildfires. But if we deal with the wildfires only as wildfires, we're not understanding that there's a whole process that's making it inevitable that there will be more and more wildfires. So we've got to go back to the beginning and do this other thing. But um, I think that what I've seen also, I haven't really mentioned this yet, but I kind of spent quite a lot of time now over the last three decades in contemplation and study of, of systems. So I can tell you a lot about different systems, but I also came to the conclusion that individual scholarship is relatively irrelevant at this time we need a collective consciousness. And so what we really need to do is we need to do what I have been calling collaborative inquiry for collective intelligence. So the dream isn't that I spin a vision that everybody has to accept. It's that, that people join together in order to share knowledge. And I mean, the internet is part of this. If we can get rid of the pollution and the, and the, the sort of unfactual stuff, then we can make sure that everyone has access to the sum of human knowledge instantaneously. So then at that point, then it massively changes the education system and it changes our, our knowledge. And then collectively we can dream what it is that humanity wants. And I think at that point from personally, my, my, my hope would be that this is not more greed and more ignorance. It's for consciousness and generosity. So if we, if we, uh, live our lives with consciousness and generosity, we get a completely different result than if we live our lives from selfishness and greed. And if that becomes the norm, if that becomes the worldview, then it's respectful of the cosmologies of all people around the world. I think the Judeo-Christian Islamic thing is basically like, no, you, you know, one brother killed another brother and they and lied about it. That's the basis of this whole thing. And then that worshiping a golden calf instead of believing in life and abundance. Well, okay, so we, oh, all right. So that was telling us, but instead of, instead of listening to the prophets, 
we followed the golden calf. Well, that's not a good idea. Don't follow the golden calf. You know, the, pa the, the golden calf is a mistake. <laughs> you know, do not worship golden calves. Do not be dazzled by shiny objects. Look at the abundance of life. Realize that death is part of life, that we're walking on the remains of all life since the beginning of time and that we will join them. We are here, you know, we, we're, our, our expression of life is, is not only that we're alive today, it's that we are contributing to the sum of human knowledge and we are going to die. And that's natural and normal. And, you know, we shouldn't run from that and pretend that we're going to live forever or that grasping at material things is somehow an expression of anything. I mean, it's like, a, it's like a waste of your life to grasp at material things because you're causing the conditions that cause enormous suffering around the world. So how can we understand that? How can we share that? I think it's to live simply in ecosystem restoration camps and to learn these things. And when we know these things to move toward eco villages where we're restoring all degraded lands on the earth and we're living in harmony with each other and with life. Hmm. That's, that's, that's what I hope for in the future. John, I'll, I'll let that sink in. You've given us so much in this episode today. Thank you so much for your, you know, your powerful engagement across the planet for the way you walk your walk and for the insights that you share today. Thank you. My pleasure. What else can I do? But, now go fix a radiator. <laughs> <laughs>